Hello, Giants fans, and welcome to a new edition of the Valentine's Views podcast here on Big Blue View Radio, part of your SB Nation family of podcasts. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts across the Big Blue View Radio network. All right, this is my final show before Thursday's 2023 NFL Draft, and here to help me break everything down Regarding your New York Giants and, and the draft is Patricia Train, a good friend from Giants Country and Locked On Giants. How you doing, Patty? I'm ready for the draft, Ed. Let's get this started already. Let's get it over with. Who's the 25th Let's get pick? Get it over with. Exactly. Over. Come on, who's the, who's the, the, the No, you got to tell me. That's what I brought you on the show for. Come on, who's the I don't 25th know. pick? I, I, that's why I came on the show. I thought you were going to tell me. All right, folks. Show's <laughs> over. We're done. <laughs> Neither one of us knows who the pick's going to be. We're done. <laughs> oh, all right, Patty. That actually is a that actually is a good place to start because it is very very different. It is a very very different feeling in covering this draft and trying to trying to to figure out how this draft might go than it's been in quite a while because. As Joe said the other day, Joe Shane said the other day, it's a whole lot different when you've got five and seven than when you have 25. It's a whole lot different in terms of predicting it, in terms of setting your board, in terms of figuring out what players might be available to you. I mean, there's 24 decisions that have to get made before the Giants get a chance to pick. So very, very different. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, rightfully so. I mean, when you're picking in the top 10, I think you have as good a chance as anybody of guessing what the team's going to do. Now that you're in the bottom third of the draft, good luck trying to figure it out. I mean, a good, you don't even know if they're going to stay put at 25. Maybe they move up. Maybe they move down. Maybe they move out of the first round. I mean, there's any number of possibilities, which further complicates, you know, trying to, to guess what exactly they're going to do there. But um you know, it's like I've told people who ask me all the time, you got to see how the board falls. You know, we could sit here and we can run simulation after simulation, but you got to see how the actual board falls. And, you know, then sometimes there's like a late move. You know, the uh, I think the Patriots acquired Allen Robinson, if I'm not mistaken. You know, the Giants just signed Sean Robinson, which changes, you know, maybe the or lessens the priority for, for defensive linemen. So. All of that stuff factors into the equation. And, and to just sit here, you know, you might as well put a blindfold on and throw darts against a dartboard and you have just as much of a chance of being right as you do, you know, trying to apply all kinds of logic. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that general managers and scouts and everyone will tell you is there's 32 picks in first round and obviously only 31 this year. I know, you know, Miami doesn't have a pick, but. The reality of it is there are never 31 players or 32 players with pure first round grades. There's no such thing as, as a, a consensus big board that the, that the entire league works from there's, or no such thing as best player available that the entire league, you know, will, uh, will agree on. Daniel Jeremiah's got his big board. Mel Kuyper's got his. We have ours at Big Blue View. You probably have yours at Giants Country. And they mean nothing because the one that means something is the one that Joe Shane is staring at on Thursday night. And it has nothing to do with anything that we've done. Exactly. I mean, what's the saying? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And then you throw in the fact that, you know, despite what teams say, they do factor in need. And there are other decisions that get factored into the equation, which I don't think a lot of people think about. So that's why it's so difficult to sit here, you know, and and say, oh, the Giants have got to draft this guy if he's here. or They got to go this direction. There's just other angles to to, to the the prism, so to speak. And I, you know, you'll never, nobody will ever get all the angles, but, you know, there's a lot more to it you know, than, than just, oh, you know, this is the best player available, but, you know, is this receiver better than this cornerback? You know, where does need, you know, when does need tip the, the scale? So just so many factors. Absolutely. And before we get into some of those factors, Patty, 
if we're talking purely about round one, I mean, I see four scenarios. I see cornerback, which I think is the biggest need on the roster, to be honest with you. I see wide receiver if there's one guy that they would bang the table for that lands there at 25. I could see center or interior offensive lineman if the, if Joe is really serious that he thinks somebody like Ben Bredesen can play center, which which I'm uh, I'm not in favor of. And, and the other thing is the other thing is you know trade down, just take the best player on your board, whatever. So there's there's a lot of different ways the Giants can go. Just in in your viewpoint, the way you see it. I mean, did I did I leave anything out? Yeah, you did actually. All right, these are the scenarios I see. First off, I don't think they go center in, in round one. Neither I, do I, but I think it's I think it's I one that you just have to happens. throw in there. But I'm gonna I'm gonna give you what I think could happen. And I'm gonna give you multiple, you know, scenarios here. So <clears throat> they could obviously stay put um, and they could take a receiver or a cornerback. I think cornerback, like you do, is the pressing need. Now, the last time a team drafting at number 25, st you know, stayed in that spot, you'd have to go back to 2016 when the Steelers stayed put. And six years in a row, Patty. Six years in a row. That yeah, six years traded. in a row. So that being said, I always tell people, let's see how the board falls. So if, say, for example, one of those top receivers starts to slide down within striking distance, and, and let me preface this by saying, I do not think the Giants are going to keep all 10 picks. And the reason why I say that is for cap purposes, which we can talk about later if you want. I don't think the Giants take all 10. I think they're going to move up. And there's also going to be some trade backs, which I could talk about later as well. But you got to look at the draft at, at a three-year window. It's, you're not just drafting for this year. You're drafting for next year and the year after that. So I think they could potentially move up if one of those receivers or top corners start to slide down the board. If not, if you're Shane, see if you could trade down or out of the first round. I'm going to say trade out of the first round. And here's why I say you maybe trade out of the first round. If you can pick up some picks in next year's draft, because remember, the Giants did a lot of um, signings on free agency. They are not projected to get any comp picks next year. You want to have extra picks to move around the board. So if you could find a partner willing to trade up, maybe somebody who's who's got a top 10 pick in the second round, and that person, you know, that team is willing to trade up, why not trade back? I mean, especially the guys that you want. If you don't have a first round grade on any of the guys that are that that come up at 25, why not take that approach? I, I think it makes all the sense in the world. You're you're addressing, you know, you're getting two picks in, and, and you're helping your salary cap and you're also giving yourself some assets that you can use for next year plus additional assets if you want to move around and like you know when you get to the bottom of the second round or the third round yeah absolutely i mean i i have said at big blue view a few times that i think you know, Joe's going to move around. I absolutely agree with you he's not making all 10 picks he showed us last year that he's willing to move around and I'm sorry, there's just there's no way that 10 draft picks are making the 53 man roster. No, it's just not to mention, as you said, the cap imp implications of, you know, of having to, to pay all of those guys. Although, you know, it's not it it's not a huge cap hit the deeper you get into the draft, but it's still a little bit of a drain and the Giants aren't in a great cap situation as it is. I think it's probably more likely personally that they move down at 25 than it is that they move up. I, I, I have been, I have been saying, yeah, go ahead and move down. Yeah. Go ahead and move down. And then, you know, you'll, you'll get an extra asset maybe in this draft, get some more assets for 2024, as you said, and, and then move around the board on day two. Go get, yeah. go get a player or two that you targeted, you know, with, with all those assets that, that you have. So here's something that I wanted to ask you when we talk about trading down, you mentioned the idea of going all the way out of the first round. And 
on the talent board, you're dealing with guys that have first and second round grades. So you may be dealing with, you know, a group of 10 or 15 players that you have very similar grades on or that are in the same group. I've been a proponent of, yeah, trade down, but do everything you can to stay in the first round, which obviously limits the Giants in terms of their options for trading down. But I keep looking at that fifth-year option and and thinking I really don't want to give up that fifth-year option just from a long-term, you know, roster building, uh, you know, salary cap perspective. I'm not sure I'd want to give that up. I mean, just your thoughts on that. Since you, since you're the cap expert and I'm not. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's something you take into consideration. But Ed, if the guy comes in, if if you give up that option and you take a second rounder, and let's let's use Xavier McKinney as an as an example, he was a second round pick. You try and get him locked up before his contract sign, you know, expires, because you know the danger with the fifth with with the fifth year option, while it is a handy tool to have. Look at what it's doing right now for the Giants. So you've got Dexter Lawrence on the fifth-year option, and he's got a $12 million cap hit, which is choking up the cap. So isn't it better to say, okay, you know what, Dexter, you're you're on the uprise. We want to get you signed to a new deal so that we can help our cap and we can ensure that you're taken care of financially. Think about it for a second here. You know, it's kind of also the same situation with Saquon, who even though he's on the franchise tag, we use that as an example. You're Saquon. If you're Dexter, wouldn't you rather have a contract with multiple years of guaranteed money that exceed what your one-year tender or your one-year franchise tag is paying you? I know I would. So yeah. I think it makes more sense from a, a player's perspective. And if you're the Giants, you know, if you're Joe Shane trying to sell this to John Mara and Steve Tisch, that's the argument I think you have to take. Yeah, I think the, the other thing as – you and I have both talked about is I do think they're in a situation where if they can get assets for 2024, that's a huge plus. Absolutely. I mean, but, look, Joe did a pretty good job, I think, of addressing many of the, the, the priority needs. You know, he added speed mm-hmm. to the offense, got himself Darren Waller, Paris Campbell. Um, they they beefed up the run defense, which was a huge problem last year. Now, people say, well, they didn't do anything about the interior of the offensive line. Well, they they added Hassan now or so, you know, he's probably a stopgap. They didn't replace Julian Love. Well, they brought in Bobby McCain, who's, who's again, a stopgap. They didn't address cornerback, really. They added, you know, that kid, Amani. Oh, I'm going to call because I'm still trying to learn how to say his last name. Oruwari, I think. Oruwari. Is so, yeah, I, I got to, I got to practice that. <laughs> I, I did. I, 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 I talked about him on the podcast two or three weeks ago, and at that point, I knew how to say the guy's name. <laughs> well, you're, you're further ahead than I am. But, but um, getting back to my point is, there's a lot of stopgap. Um, players on this team, guys who have one-year contracts, prove-it deals. And if you think about it, Bobby Okereke is really the only guy who they signed in free agency who has more than one year on his deal. You know, I, And I don't count Darius Slayton. That's a two-year deal. Joe Shane, his, his, his practice has been stopgaps. And if these stopgaps prove that they can be part of the long-term picture, then, hey, then you re-sign them. But in the meantime, they serve as, as temporary plugs until they can address the needs in the draft. And I think that's the approach he's taken the last couple of years. Um, last year, more so because of the cap situation being as bad as it is. But this year, you know, the, the, you, can, you can make the case that the cap situation, while better, is still not where it needs to be. Absolutely. And, Patty, before we move on to our next topic that I really want to get to, I mean, can you? Can you just imagine the screaming on your website and mine and our Twitter accounts if if Joe trades out of the first round and people don't have a first round pick to talk about on Thursday night? Can you imagine the screaming I'm going to do if I go all, all the way out to East Rutherford and I'm sitting there for nothing? <laughs> well, I'm going to be like, st- what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, seriously, I mean, I think it, I could see it making sense and. And, you know, listen, no, it does. When you when you explain it that way, you, the way that we we talked about a couple minutes ago, um, you know, I've been 
like I said, I've been kind of hung up on trying to keep that fifth year option. But if you can get into the top of the second round and you're still picking from the same pool of players, right? Um, you know, then you I guess at that point, yeah, then I, you know, th then that that does make some sense. And you know, one of the things that we've been sort of skirting around here a little bit is the idea, you know, fans get hung up on. Well, we need this position to go out and beat the Eagles this year. You know, we need a guy at this position to go beat the Eagles. We've got to trade all the way up and get the best wide receiver in the draft or, or whatever so that we can go beat the Eagles or we've got to get the best cornerback. And I always try to tell people the draft is not necessarily about the upcoming season. The draft is about the long term. The draft is about setting yourself up for future success and trying to land as many guys as you possibly can who you think have a chance to be, you know, not only one year or one contract players, but two contract players for you. Exactly. That's what it's, that's what Shane said he wanted to do. You know, look at the teams that rely heavily on free agency. It very rarely, if ever, works. And, you know, you talk about what fans think the Giants need in order to compete with the Eagles. It's pretty clear, I think, you know, to, to anybody who's watching, what did the Eagles, how did the Eagles excel over the Giants in the playoffs? They beat them in the run game, which the Giants addressed. They, be, they beefed up the run defense. But more importantly, they got to get speed on the back end of that defense because, when you're facing C.D. Lamb and Terry McLaurin and A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith two times a year and you don't have speed on the back end to cover those guys, well, then you might as well mail it in at that point because you're not going anywhere in the division. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. I had a mailbag question the other day. And it was, you know, it was a cap related question and it was Jalen Hurts and his contract and how can Howie Roseman do all of these things? And when is Joe Shane going to learn Howie Roseman's tricks and, and start doing the kinds of things that, that Howie Roseman does? And, and my answer to that was, look, you're being really unfair to Joe here. Right. Howie Roseman's been in that chair for 14 years. Every player on that roster was drafted or signed by Howie Roseman. Joe has been in this chair for a little bit more than a year. He is still dealing with a lot of players he didn't bring on board, with a lot of contracts he did not negotiate. So there are a lot of things that Joe is still working his way out from underneath. Mm -hmm. And you, you can't compare... Howie Roseman after 14 years to Joe Shane after 15 months. No. And you can't compare where the Eagles are in a, in a win now window to where the giants are in a, we're still building and our, and our decisions have to have the long term in mind, you know, type of situation. Yeah. Not to mention Howie Roseman is, he, I mean, he's a genius with the cap. I don't know if you saw it, but Albert Breer, I think it was, was it Albert Breer or, or Pelissero? One of the two of them posted a breakdown of Jalen Hurts' contract and how it's structured. It is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Now people will, will look at the money and they'll say, oh, well, it's a big risk. Yeah, but there, there are escape hatches along the way and just the way it's structured it's just I, I was reading it over lunch and i was like oh my gosh this is just brilliant howie roseman should teach you know a, a salary cap course you know it, it it was that brilliant and and you know we'll see if, if it comes back to bite them you know but um look the more you do the job the more you learn about the intricacies and right now you know joe shane does have Brandon Brown, you know, who came from the Howie Roseman School of, of, you know, football management, and Kevin Abrams, who is still very much involved with salary cap management, as is Ed Triggs and the other people that, you know, manage the cap. So as Joe gets a better handle on this, he's going to be able to do a lot more. Because remember, he said coming in, I don't know if you remember his presser, 
he said, you know, there are certain things that I'm strong in and other areas I have to learn and I will learn them. But in the meantime, I'm going to make sure I have myself surrounded by people who understand the areas that I'm not strong in so that we don't falter as an organization. Right. And it's just, it's one of those things where I just think that, that you can't, you, the, the two things are not the same at this point. So it's, it's really not a fair comparison. And I think largely because Joe is not dealing with, you know, Joe is not dealing with a, with a roster full and an, and an organization full of players and decisions and contracts that he made. Right. So, so he's, that will take time. Yeah, absolutely. Gotta be patient. And, this is a three year rebuild. The Giants, I think, will be better than they were last year. You know, you got to put faith in the coaching staff, too, which to me proved that they they knew how to, you know, get the most out of guys. But it's going to take some time. And, and you, know, you know, people just have to be patient. Honestly, better, quote unquote, better might mean they win the same number of games because you can look at 2022 as the Giants having overachieved in some ways and maybe having won more games than they should have and maybe having been ahead of schedule. So they might be better and they might still win the same number of right. games. Right. So, they, might win, they might win you know, the same number of games, but instead of by one score, maybe now they're blowing people out. Right. You so, never know. Exactly. So it's, uh, you know, Mark Schofield always says progress isn't linear. Right. So just because you get to nine one year doesn't mean you doesn't mean you're destined to get to 10 the next year. Mm -hmm. He's right. But, you know, one of the one of the other things, Patty, that I think we need to talk about, we talk about, you know, building for the long term and, you know, the draft not necessarily being about 2023, you know, fans tend to look at okay, this is the big board and this is the position where we need help and we've got to have corner and we've got to have, you know, we've got to have linebacker or we've got to have wide receiver or whatever. But Joe made reference to this the other day. One of the, the pieces of that decision of what you do is contracts and it's roster structure and <coughs> One of the reasons, for example, that I look at cornerback and I say it's such a big need is, okay, people say, well, we've got a Dory Jackson and he's the number one guy and everybody else is a question mark. Seriously, everybody else is pretty much a question mark because we just don't know if they can handle full-time duty. Mm -hmm. The other part of that equation is a Dory Jackson's entering the last year of his contract. And if Joe Shane and Brian Dable were 100% convinced that they wanted Adoree Jackson long-term beyond 2023, Adoree Jackson would already have a new contract. So there is, there is a possibility that they need to replace Adoree Jackson. And you'd like to have a guy with at least a year of experience, you know, out there starting, mm -hmm. you know, as you do that. So that's, that's a factor. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to your point about Adoree Jackson, you know, solid cornerback, but how many interceptions has he come up with since joining the team? Two? He's dropped more than he's come up with, Patty. Exactly. That's all I know. Exactly. So, you know, do you really want to invest big money in a guy who doesn't really come who's, up with those big plays? I mean, he, he's not a game changer, Patty. No, that's, he's not a game changer. You know, he's, he's solid. You know, he's functional. I have no problem if he's the starter. But you're looking at a cornerback class in this draft that is so deep that you could probably even get a starter as late as the third or fourth round. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how deep this class is. Every draft analyst, every college football person I've spoken with all say the same thing, that this is a historically deep cornerback class. And you can get a, you know, if you want to wait to get a, get a starter, you could probably wait to second, third, fourth round, early fourth round, and and, and still come up with a guy who, in, in a few years, is got, people are going to forget where he was taken. That they're going to think he was a first rounder. Right. It might not be Sauce Gardner, but no. But he's going to be a good player for you. Yep. And 
The other contract, the other thing that I find so interesting at this point, Patty, is not Saquon Barkley, because I think in some way, shape, or form, that'll work out. But And if it works out that, that he plays on the franchise tag, I honestly think Joe Shane would be just fine with that. He'd love it if he can get a deal with him that would drive his cap hit down in 2023, but, but I'm still a believer in the fact that I – don't think it would kill Joe Shane, you know, not to end up giving Saquon Barkley a long-term deal. But you now, so since I since I since I put that out there, just your thoughts on that, real quick, before I go to where I to the the player I was going to go to. Yeah, I mean, look, I would love for Saquon to get a long-term deal. I mean, he has been a wonderful representative of the franchise. He has been a good player for them. You know, the injuries, I know people will say, well, what about the injuries? Well, that's not his fault. It's just unfortunate that that happened. That being said, you cannot pay Saquon Barkley like a Christian McCaffrey. You know, I had Joel Corey on my show last week, and we talked about the position, the running back position, and how it has actually devalued over the last several years money-wise. You don't see the big money really going to the running backs anymore. So, you know, it's unfortunate, but in Saquon's case, he hit free agency at the wrong time, all right? Um, You know, between the the fact that there's, this is a a very deep running backs class, the fact that the market tanked, I mean, look, Dalvin Cook, I think is is facing issues where, you know, he might not make, stick around, he might get traded or released. Ezekiel Elliott got cut. Miles Sanders signed for what six and a quarter, six and a half, or something like that per year. The market just isn't there. So why continue to beat that horse? I mean, if you're Saquon Barkley, and if you're his agent, you're probably saying to him, "Look, okay, the the, the deck is stacked against us. So maybe what we do is we gamble. We gambled on you last year, and you had a good year. We take that gamble again, and then we try again next year. The problem with that." is that all it takes is for an injury and that gamble goes out the window. So again, just going back to what I was saying before, you hope that Saquon kind of comes to his senses and and the Giants put that offer that they withdrew back on the table. And hopefully, you know, Saquon says, okay, you know what? I'd rather have multiple years guaranteed money that add up to a lot more than the 10.1 that the million that the tag is going to pay me than to just, you know, stand on principle. You know, go for a shorter term deal if you have to, if, you, if you're that sure that you're going to be able to, you know, cash in at some point. But I would hope he would try to come to his senses and just realize that, look, the market's just not there. You've had an injury history. All it takes is for somebody to roll up on your ankle. And guess what? That 10.1 million, which looks pretty good now, might not look that good when, you, when you're sitting in the trainer's uh, table. Right. And I had Mike Garofolo on my show a week or so ago, and he said, look, the Giants have been more than fair to Saquon. Mm-hmm. When you look at Miles Sanders at 6.2 or 6.4 or whatever it is, and offering Saquon twice that much money, they've been more than fair to Saquon. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. if Saquon doesn't want to take that offer, that's on him. Exactly. I mean, look, I don't begrudge Saquon for wanting to get as much money as he can. We all think we're worth more than than what we get paid. I know you do. I know I do. I mean, Saquon's no different. But at some point, you got to be realistic and you've got to say, okay, this is what the market is dictating. You know, do I want to be paid on the high end of the market? Yeah, I would like that. But, you know, do I do I want to, you know, do I want to dig in and hope that I'm going to get 20 times the amount that that. The market is calling for him. No, I mean, you, you've got to be realistic. Otherwise, you're not going to get anything done. Yeah. Patty, there's one more player I think we have to talk about, and I think that's Leonard Williams. Uh, the Giants, you know, the other day they signed a Sean Robinson. Earlier in free agency, they signed, you know, Raheem Nunez Roches. Um, so they've got a couple of quality, you know, depth pieces along that defensive line that they didn't have before. Dexter Lawrence will get his long-term deal. But I am very, very curious about Leonard Williams' long-term future with the New York Giants. I have 
some thoughts of, of my own on, uh, on what may or may not happen with Williams, but I'm curious just, just what you think, you know, that what you think is going on with Leonard Williams and, and whether, you know, and whether you think that might impact the Giants draft strategy at all. That's an interesting question. Um, the first thing that I think we need to find out, and I don't know if the Giants will tell us this, but I think it's a question that needs to be asked, is where does Leonard Williams stand with that neck injury that he was dealing with at the end of the season? You know, that could be why nothing has been done with Leonard Williams. That could be one reason why that, you know, maybe that neck injury or that, what, what, what was it, a neck or a shoulder? I forget what it was. It was a neck. It was a neck. Okay, so maybe it's not where it needs to be. So that could be a possibility. So maybe the Giants are saying, okay, you know what? We'll wait. Rather than rush to sign the guy, we'll wait. You know, the season doesn't start till September. We can we can afford to wait. The other thing could be Leonard Williams just doesn't want to do something with his contract that, you know, look, initially he signed um, with the intention of, of hitting free agency again before he turned 30. So maybe he wants to stick to his guns on that which is fine. That's his choice. It could also be a mixture of the two that maybe the giants are looking at him and saying, okay, this guy's had some injury issues. The production just wasn't what, what it was, you know, a few years ago when, when he was signed to the bigger contract, he's getting long in the tooth. Um, you know, we're going to have to cut back on his snaps because he, let, let's face it. He and Dexter have been playing an awful lot the last two years. So maybe we're not going to pay him, you know, a ton of money. Maybe they're going to shift it to, you know, now the pass rush is going to be all about Thibodeau and, and, and Ojulari and another edge rusher that they bring in. So there's any number of scenarios here at play. Um, so I'm not sure how it's going to work out. I thought for sure the Giants would look to maybe get that down, that number, because I think he's got a 32 million cap hit down. But remember, they got that number up by restructuring him multiple times. So maybe, you know, if you're, you're Leonard, you say, no, I don't want to add more years onto my contract. Although they could do, put dummy years on if need be. But then again, you'll never get out of cap hell if you keep doing that. So that is, yeah, that's something that Joe has, has been very averse to doing. Yep. He didn't do it in Daniel Jones's deal. So it is something I know he doesn't want to do. I'm just very curious. And you kind of hit most of the points with Leonard Williams, Patty, because I think he's 29, but he's played eight years now in the NFL. He's played an incredible number of snaps. He's been one of those guys that's never hurt, played 90 or 90% of the snaps or more every single year. Last year's the first year he was hurt, and it was a significant injury. To me, the reality of it is ninth year in the league, he showed for the first time last year that he broke down a little bit. To me, you're looking at a guy who it's probably not going to get better. I mean, in the sense that you're going to see a little bit more breakdown. You're going to see some missed games. You're going to see, as you said, maybe having to monitor his snaps a little bit. And do you want to commit three more years of money to this player? Yeah. I, I I I just think the Giants are going to do everything possible to to get around having to do anything with his deal. I could see that being the case, even though that's where they can get some money. But again, that's why you know when we talked about it earlier, that's why I think there's a, a strong case to be made to trade out of the first round of the draft if you can. That's why I think there's a case to you know get Dexter done. I think Dexter will get done after the draft at some point. I mean, there's no doubt that they will get a long-term deal and they'll get that number down. If they don't get Saquon down, where else can get, they get money? All right. Maybe you extend Tyrod Taylor another year, you know, cause he's got, I think he's got a right. five million base salary. They mm -hmm. could probably get him down if they need to. And there was one other guy and I can't remember who it was. I did it. I did an article for this on Giants country where they can find more cap money. There's one other guy. Was it Darnay Holmes that that you know who, if he doesn't make the roster, um, I think that's three million that they can get back there. So they can find some money. And then also remember, 
Mm-hmm. Once they get into training camp, some of these veterans that they signed to one year veteran minimum deals probably won't make the roster. Right. So they will find some money. Now, will they have enough to get through the year? It's going to be tight, but I think they'll be able to do it. But yeah, they just, they don't have, there isn't, other than Leonard Williams, there isn't that one obvious way to get a big chunk. Unless you do oh. Adoree Jackson, which we, I think we both agree, probably it's not going to happen. Right. So anyway, Patty, looking forward to uh, to Thursday night. Make sure you get a nap Thursday. Oh, you yeah, better believe be a- it. I'm going to be a long night. Make sure you get a nap. I know I'm, I'm going to make sure I get one and, uh, and we'll see what happens. But, you know, if he doesn't make a pick, if he makes a trade, you'll still have something to write about Thursday, Patty. Oh, I, I'm sure I will. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you much for the time, Patty. Giants fans, thank you as always for listening. And please stay safe out there. Take care of each other. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.